Hello, my name is Carol Lenny, and I'm with St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto and the Cochrane Hypertension Group at the University of BC. I'll be talking today about our study, Over Half of Clinical Practice Guidelines, Use a Non-Systematic Method to Inform Recommendations, a Method Study. Please tweet my presentation at carol underscore Lenny. We have no conflicts and no funding to declare. Our primary objective was to assess whether systematic methods were used in the development of clinical practice guideline recommendations. So why is it important for clinical practice guidelines to systematically analyze the evidence? So there are international standards to promote a systematic review process, such as the ones from the Institute of Medicine, from AGREE, or from Guidelines International Network. Evidence shows that CPG quality is variable, but there are tools like the AMSTAR or ROBUS which are validated to assess the quality of systematic reviews. They're more comprehensive than their GREE 2 tool domain 3 rigor of development. If a CPG uses inappropriate methods to synthesize the evidence, the validity of the findings can be compromised and bias can creep in. So what is bias though? Bias research refers to systematic error, meaning that multiple replications of the same study would reach the wrong answer on average. So do limitations in the study potentially bias the findings? And bias may overestimate the effects of a drug or intervention. Bias should not be confused with imprecision. Imprecision refers to random error, meaning that multiple replications of the same study will produce different effect estimates because of sampling variation. For example, the results of similar, smaller studies with few events are less precise and produce wide confidence intervals. Bias all is also not the same as quality in study conduct. So even a well-conducted study can be at risk of bias. For example, in studies where blinding is impossible, such as surgical trials where the surgeon can't be blinded. Similarly, not all methodological flaws are relevant to bias. For example, failure to perform a sample size calculation or to obtain ethical approval are important markers of study quality, but they're unlikely to bias study results. So bias is also not the same as the quality of reporting. Studies rarely report the methods used in great detail. Studies may have used rigorous methods, even if they're not described well in the published paper. So here are examples of different biases with two different study designs. Bias in randomized control trials, for example, could be random treatment allocation, allocation concealment, or blinding of participants. However, bias in systematic reviews or evidence syntheses can be such as publication bias, where only positive randomized control trials are published and included in that review. Reporting bias, such as selectively choosing to report only positive outcomes and not the negative ones, or selectively choosing to report only positive analyses and not the negative analyses. So, in a desert prison, an older prisoner befriends a new arrival. The young prisoner talks constantly about escape, spinning plan after plan. After a few months, he makes a break. When the guards capture him and bring him back, he half stars and crazy with thirst. He wails about how awful it was to the old prisoner. End endless stretches of sand, no, no oasis, failure at every turn. The old prisoner listens for a while and says, Yep, I know. I tried those escape plans myself 20 years ago. You did? asks the young prisoner. Why didn't you tell me? The old prisoner shrugs and says, No one publishes negative results. This anecdote 
aptly illustrates a publication bias or reporting bias. So the process used to gather, assess, and synthesize evidence to inform recommendations, systematic or non-systematic, can be either from a literature review, which is defined as not having searched two or more databases for relevant literature and not having followed systematic methods, or systematic reviews, which I'll define later, or overviews of reviews, which aim to primarily include and synthesize the results at the meta-analysis level, not at the primary study level, which systematic reviews do. So coming back to our systematic review definition, a review is considered systematic if all questions were formulated into PICO or population intervention comparison and outcome format. Inclusion criteria were specified for all study types, for, for example, for trials, for cohort studies. The reviewers searched two or more databases and two people screened studies against inclusion criteria independently. We included clinical practice guidelines if they had a minimum of two explicit recommendations for treatment or management of a condition. They also had to describe their methods in the main manuscript of the guideline or supplementary documents, and they had to provide a reference list. They, what we did to find these guidelines is we searched the TRIP and Epistemonicus um, databases from 2017 to 2018. Well, two people screened these studies and two people extracted the data independently. We ended up with 417 guidelines which we randomly sorted and then sequentially screened by their random numbers to finally include 50 guidelines. So our results, what did we find? We found that the majority of guidelines were produced in North America and were funded by medical societies or pharmaceutical companies. Guidelines related to a variety of treatment and clinical conditions. The majority of authors disclose conflicts of interest, some conflicts, and 66% of authors were affiliated with the pharmaceutical industry. We also found that 66% of clinical practice guidelines use a non-systematic process to evidence synthesis. As well, 61% of guidelines search two or more databases, 60% formulated questions as PICO, 58% had explicit inclusion and exclusion criteria, 60% assess the quality of the included primary studies. And finally, 10% assess the quality of the included reviews. So here's an example of a good clinical practice guideline that conducted a systematic evidence synthesis. It had a full method section. It formulated a list of PICO questions. It searched five databases. It assessed the quality of both the included reviews as well as the quality of the primary studies. So can one trust guidelines? A systematic process should be followed to ensure that the evidence synthesis is accurate, valid, of the highest pathological quality, and based on all relevant literature. Non-systematic methodology to gather, appraise, and synthesize evidence may lead to biased results and over or underestimation of treatment effects, which are especially harmful when used to support guideline recommendations. Patient healthcare providers and policymakers need in turn the highest quality guidelines to inform decisions about which treatments should be used in healthcare practice. I thank you and I welcome questions.